Alright guys, how's it going? Every time I do one of these different types of videos, the same thing happens. First of all, when I did the Aliens Don't Exist video, a large number of crackpots would slam me for being part of the program to hide the truth. Then, when I made my global warming video, people come out of the woodwork to slam me for taking sides and being political. And then, most recently, when I made my singularity video here, people would tell me to stop promoting atheist nonsense. And here is a selection of the comments that I enjoyed reading. Jim, knowing how much details you put into your video arguments, I'd expect more from you. There is no merit to today's science as far as evolutionary biology is concerned. And the same one continued with, I'm not trying to force you to think one way, but your arguments are sadly weak in this regard. You can remain blissfully ignorant of the truth. It's your call after all. And after reading far more of these kind of comments that I cared to argue over, I decided to actually look deeply into the subject of evolution. And some of what I found was shocking. Like this views on evolution slide, which showed responses to the statement, human beings, as we know them, developed from earlier species of animals. And the true responses are light blue, those that are still unsure are the purples, and those that disagree with this statement in green. And if we look at a selection of the countries, we can see around Europe at least, it's probably as expected. The northern countries, Iceland, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway too, they're all hovering around about the 80% belief in evolution and between 10 and 20% disbelief. The more historically religious countries like Italy, Ireland and Poland, and then a bunch of Eastern European countries are a bit less convinced by the evolution argument. Japan, unsurprisingly, up there with the Northern European countries. Now, these last two. Turkey, around about 25% belief in evolution, over 50% disbelief. But that's not really particularly surprising. USA, 40% belief in evolution, 40% disbelief, and 20% unsure. And what's more, the belief in evolution is dropping. As a few years ago, it was 45%. Nowadays, only 4 in 10 Americans believe in evolution. The majority of you guys watching this are American, which means that there must be thousands of you who are either unsure about evolution or don't believe it's true. So today, whether you're American, Turkish, French, or even Martian, I will convince those of you who are still unsure and those of you who are still open to having your disbelief challenged that human beings, as we know them, developed from earlier species of animals. This will be one in a series of videos called Faith in Science, which sets out to demolish bad science and superstition with overwhelming facts. And I will release them sporadically when there's not a whole lot of technology to talk about. William Strata Smith, born in 1769 and died in 1839, was an English geologist who was credited with creating the first detailed nationwide geological map of any country. This exact map here, in fact, of England, Wales, and a little bit of Scotland. And at age 18, William found work as a surveyor, and a few years later was working for the Somerset Coal Canal Company. This was during the Industrial Revolution, and as he inspected numerous coal mines in the area, he observed and recorded the various layers of rock and coal exposed by the mining and the creation of these canals. And as he observed the rock layers, or strata, these horizontal layers of rock that we can see in these examples from around the world, again here, here, and here. As Smith observed these at the mines and canals, he realised that they were arranged in a predictable pattern and that the various strata could always be found in the same relative positions. In addition to that, each particular stratum could be identified by the fossils that it contained. And Smith also noted that the exact same succession of fossil groups, from older rocks to younger rocks, could be found in many parts of England. The exact same succession, every time. And he also noted that the older fossils, nearer to the lowest strata, had more basic biological features, and fossils nearer the top strata were more advanced. And Smith called this the principle of faunal, or fossil, succession. And sometime later, the different strata would be grouped in different periods of the Earth's geological history. Smith never saw any dinosaur bones though, like we see here. The first dinosaur bone was discovered by another Englishman, Robert Plott, in 1677, and that was detailed in his book, 
the natural history of Oxfordshire. Plot had no concept of dinosaurs though, and after ruling out large known animals like the elephant, he decided that it must have been a bone from a giant human being. And we had to wait until 1824, when bones discovered in 1815 were described by yet another Englishman, William Buckland, were realised as being something else entirely, deriving from a large carnivorous reptile to which he gave the name Megalosaurus. Buckland still didn't recognise the bones as being dinosaur though, as in a new, separate species derived from reptiles. Even though he named it as a sore, Buckland and Smith were getting on a bit in years when a much younger Englishman called Charles Darwin embarked on a five-year voyage around the world on the HMS Beagle. Darwin was brought on the voyage as an expert on geology and he spent three years and three months exploring the geological features on different lands. And he too was soon detailing the many varied fossilised plants and animals that he found embedded in the rocks. Perhaps the most famous part of Darwin's voyage was at the Galapagos Islands just off Ecuador, where he collected multiple new species of birds. On San Cristobal Island, he recorded a mockingbird that was similar to one he saw in Chile. He then found a different mockingbird in Floriana Island and yet another on Isabella. He also collected multiple samples of what he thought were blackbirds, grosbeaks and finches, some of which you can see here. When Darwin finally returned home, he presented these birds that he had collected to an English ornithologist named John Gould for identification. Gould's discovery was quite shocking. From his research, he determined that the gross beaks, blackbirds and finches that Darwin had captured were in fact all finches. Twelve, in fact, new species of finch found nowhere else in the world. And of the 26 birds that Darwin presented to Gould, 25 of them were said to be new and distinct from anything else in the known world. From the combination of his own observations and the information that he was given by Gould, Darwin concluded that all of these bird species had adapted to better fit their environment. Charles Darwin observed that animals tend to produce more offspring than the available food supply can support. And when food is scarce, it causes a struggle for existence. The fittest of the offspring, or more accurately, the best adapted offspring survive. Basically, animals that are better at exploiting the available food sources will tend to live longer. And those that live longer have more offspring. That's just logical. But let me elaborate on that point. If you're a bird species in one of the islands where a certain type of insect is in plentiful supply, having a long pointed beak like we see in this warbler finch, the fourth one here, that would be an advantage. Birds that eat insects generally have long pointed beaks because it lets them get food from more difficult places deeper in trees and further in the ground. But what if drought had to hit some of the islands and suddenly insects were far less available? and the primary food source now became harder seeds and nuts. Every time these warbler finches had offspring, more of the offspring would die because there simply was not enough food for them all to survive. Within any population, there are small differences. Some people are taller and stronger than others, and some of the birds have slightly larger and stronger beaks than the rest. And when the abundant food runs out, those with the stronger beaks, they've still got access to the more difficult food supplies, like harder shelled nuts. And in fact, only one year of a particularly severe drought on the islands in 2003 brought a large change in beak size to one of the species of finch. This large ground finch that we see here had arrived on the island and they ate all the larger sized seeds. There were far more of these medium beaked finches to start with on the island but it was the ones with the smaller beaks that actually survived better because they ate the smaller seeds that were left over. These true medium-sized beaked finches perished in huge numbers and essentially nowadays, this medium beaked finch has much smaller beaks than they did previous to the severe drought in 2003. Darwin had no concept of genetics or gene inheritance like we do today. We know that we get half of our genetic material, our chromosomes, from both of our parents. 23 pairs of chromosomes for 46 in total, half from our mum and half from our dad. And this is why we have traits from both of our parents. However, during reproduction, whenever DNA is replicated, there is also a chance that genetic mutations can occur. I'll talk more in depth about mutations and DNA later, but today we know 
through genetics that the Galapagos finches are very closely related to this little dull-coloured grass quit, which is found throughout South America. This one species of bird found its way to the Galapagos Islands, and it evolved into all of these 13 species, with differences as clear as these. Darwin had evolved his own theory too, but due to fear of ridicule and perhaps even persecution by the church, he kept it quiet for almost 20 years before another English scientist, Alfred Russell Wallace, approached Darwin with his theory of evolution through natural selection, which he had come to independently. They jointly launched a paper on the subject before Darwin finally decided it was now time to release his famous book on the origin of species. And as I said, Darwin was a geologist, and due to the fossil record in rocks, he was well aware that the species we see on Earth today are not the same species that existed in the past, although they do resemble them. Like William Smith before him, he was also well aware that the older fossils were more basic compared to the newer fossils. So in his Origin of Species, Darwin proposed the theory that all life had evolved from much simpler forms to more complex forms, and stated that, Innumerable transitional forms must have existed, but he wondered, why do we not find them embedded in countless numbers in the crust of the Earth? In Darwin's time, there were plenty of fossils around, but nobody had found something that looked like it was in between species. However, if evolution through natural selection was true, these transitional fossils simply had to exist. The origin of species made no claims of human evolution, and Darwin's theory soon gained near complete acceptance in the scientific community. By this point, dinosaurs had finally been recognised as a separate species of fearfully great lizards, which is what the dinosaur name means. The fossil record in rocks also showed that they all appeared to have died out abruptly, completely wiped from the record, seemingly replaced by mammals, reptiles and birds. It was already known that dinosaurs and birds shared some common features. They both laid eggs, some had similar claws, some dinosaurs were found with hollow bones, just like birds. Paleontologists and biologists of the day theorised that if evolution is true, at some point in the fossil record there must be a transitional form showing a half dinosaur, half bird. They didn't have to wait long to be proven correct. Just two years after the publication of On the Origin of Species, this strange fossil was discovered in 1861 but it was missing most of its head and neck. It was described in 1863 by Richard Owen as having a long lizard-like tail, bearing a pair of feathers on each joint, and with its wings furnished with two free claws. Another specimen was discovered in 1875 and was later purchased by the Berlin Natural History Museum. This is the most famous complete specimen and the first one that was discovered with a complete head. Feathered wings are easily clear to see, as is this long feathered bony tail, which modern birds do not have. Birds today have a small tailbone. This is a peregrine falcon. Another 10 specimens of Archaeopteryx were found, making 12 in total. They were all found at the same point in the fossil record, approximately 150 million years ago at a time when dinosaurs ruled the earth and before even more bird-like fossils were found higher up in the fossil record. What else then can this be if it is not something in transition between a dinosaur and a bird? But there was still the issue that at the time Archaeopteryx was discovered, there were no good specimens of small advanced dinosaurs. All of the dinosaur fossils from that time were very large. Towards the end of the 20th century though, much smaller dinosaurs were being discovered and they showed that, except for the relative length of the forelimb, there is very little difference between primitive birds like Archaeopteryx and advanced theropods, which is a group of carnivorous dinosaurs like this dromaeosaur velociraptor, which as we can clearly see here, also had feathers on its limbs. Feathers weren't the end of the similarities though, because the velociraptors also had wishbones, breast bones, wrists that contain a crescent-shaped bone, and hands like most other advanced theropods we can clearly still see the same three fingers on its limbs, and the middle one is the longest. This is clearly a feathered dinosaur with a bunch of avian traits that we still see today. But doesn't that mean that Archaeopteryx could just have been another feathered dinosaur? Well, that topic has been hotly debated for over 100 years, 
And currently, today Archaeopteryx is actually not thought to be the ancestor of modern birds. Modern birds and Archaeopteryx are now thought to have evolved from the same ancestor, but not all species make it, some are evolutionary dead ends. If we compare the skulls of Archaeopteryx and a modern chicken, we can see similarities, but with one major difference, Archaeopteryx has teeth and chickens, as well as all other modern birds, have beaks. Surely if evolution is correct, then the fossil record must also include birds with more bird-like features and less dinosaur-like features. That too just seems logical. Here is Enantiornithes, which was discovered recently in China. It still had teeth, but that is much more like a beak shape. It also now had a very short tail, and also the bones in the hands are now fused, far more like a modern bird than Archaeopteryx. In fact, this is much more bird and less dinosaur. Two years ago, scientists pieced together this skull fossil of a transitional bird called Ichthyornis dispar. This extraordinary new specimen showed similar brain proportions to modern birds, while other parts of the skull still more closely resembled those of predatory dinosaurs. This toothed bird lived in North America around 86 million years ago, and this one is closely related to modern birds. This bird story doesn't end here though. More bird fossils for a species called Confuciosornis appeared even earlier in the fossil record around 125 million years ago. What was strange here was they had toothless beaks, though we can still see the same three finger bones, just like dinosaurs. And unlike modern birds, which have fused those three fingers into a single bone in the hand, we can see these amazing long tail feathers very clearly. And the fact that this earlier bird had no teeth is proof that evolution can converge. That is, similar features can evolve independently in species, in different periods of time. It's important to realise that evolution is not a straight line from one species to another. It's a constant branching and some species continue to evolve while others go extinct. Now you might wonder why all modern birds don't have teeth, perhaps thinking that teeth should be a huge evolutionary advantage. That does seem logical, but teeth are also quite heavy and flight is already a very energetic activity, without carrying any extra weight around. And it's clear that birds don't actually need teeth. Even birds of prey, which can easily cut open larger animals with their beaks. It is also clear that we can see that birds didn't just suddenly evolve from a T-Rex overnight, but rather the classic features of birds evolved one by one. First of all, bipedal locomotion, then feathers, then a wishbone, then more complex feathers that look like quill pen feathers, then wings. And the end result is a relatively seamless transition between dinosaurs and birds, so much so that you cannot draw an easy line between these two groups. And for those of you who thought that the dinosaurs disappeared completely when that huge asteroid wiped out most life on Earth, not quite. Dinosaurs are in fact now referred to in two branches, avian dinosaurs and non-avian dinosaurs. Have you ever looked at a chicken's feet by the way? Enjoy your dinner tonight. I'm fine, I'm a vegan. Now, I spent some time talking about dino birds there, so let's change focus to something much smaller. One of the major criticisms of evolution is that it's not scientific because it's not observable. That criticism is, in fact, completely false. It's true that we can't directly observe large-scale evolution, known as macroevolution, like from fish to land animals or from dinosaurs to birds, as these processes take hundreds of millions of years. However, we can observe small-scale evolution, microevolution, happening in certain species of salamander, one of Darwin's finches, as discussed previously, and also in certain species of grasshopper among many other examples, in fact. But as I said, focusing on something much smaller now, bacteria, specifically E. coli. Back in 1988, a young scientist called Richard Lenski began an experiment to monitor the evolution of the bacteria. The experiment was in fact quite simple. He created 12 populations of the same E. coli and put them in flasks with water, glucose, which is the food that E. coli eats, and citrate, which is a compound which helps them take up iron. Every day, each day, the population has exactly 0.1 milliliters extracted from the flask and then placed in a new flask with the same water, sugar, and citrate mix. And essentially, 
the bacteria that are extracted are allowed to continue multiplying. And every 500 generations, which takes around 75 days, a sample from each population is stored in a freezer. Early on in the experiment, the bacteria evolved to grow more quickly, and this growth continued at a slower pace. But apart from that, nothing else much had happened for over 10 years, which had Richard considering shutting the experiment down. But he was talked into continuing with it by his wife and colleagues, and fortunately, he did. In 2003, one of his students entered the lab to run through the same procedures that had been done for the previous 15 years. But upon observing the bacteria, he noticed that one of the flasks had turned opaque overnight, which is a sure sign of bacterial growth. At first, he thought some procedural error had occurred, but tests showed that nothing had gone wrong. Lenski was of course called in to investigate, and what they found was staggering. Around generation 33,127, the bacteria in the flask called Ara-3 had evolved the ability to eat the citrate, not just the sugar. And this allowed the population to grow several fold larger than it had previously, due to the large amount of citrate present in the mix. Examination of the frozen samples showed that the Ara-3 population possessed a number of unique genetic markers compared to the other 11 samples. So this ruled out any error. And in a new series of experiments, they replayed the tape of the Ara-3 evolution backwards from those frozen samples that were taken every 500 generations. In these experiments, they observed 19 new independent cases of citrate metabolism, but only when they started from clones from after generation 20,000. What this meant was that sometime around the 20,000 marker, a mutation in the Ara-3 bacteria allowed for the chance of an ability to metabolize citrate, and then later on, a further mutation caused the actual ability. Not all clones from the 20,000 marker onward evolved the actual ability though, which again shows the random nature of mutation. The LTEE, the Long Term Evolution Experiment, is now at over 70,000 generations and 30 years. But in human terms, this would be over 1 million years worth of evolution. Even though none of the 12 batches are identical today, they are all growing faster than the original batch. After 20,000 generations, they grew a staggering 70% faster, in fact, and all batches have grown in cell size. Lenski believes that this evolution will continue for many years and perhaps even indefinitely. So, as you can see, microevolution at least is absolutely real and observable in the lab. You just need an awful lot of time to see it happen, even in the fastest reproducing organisms. When we look at the fossil record in rocks, we see similar patterns everywhere. Animals like trilobites, these flattish, roundish things here, are found on the lowest levels, and higher up we begin to see more complexity. It's important to note that this is not how life began, however. This is simply when life began to leave a lot of evidence in the fossil record. Previous to this point, the animals were all soft-bodied, worm-like creatures, and soft bodies just tend to dissolve into nothing when they die. Previous to animals existing, it was bacteria and single-celled organisms going back billions of years. Trilobites, though, were among the first animals with a hard calcium carbonate shell, and that's what we are seeing when we're looking at these fossils. It was a very, very successful animal lasting hundreds of millions of years, beginning in the early Cambrian 520 million years ago. The reason for its success was undoubtedly the evolution of this hard shell, which would clearly be a huge selective advantage against predation. Now, looking at the fossil record of the Grand Canyon, we can see that the oldest fossils there are in fact stromatolites. These things here, which are colonies of bacteria, which photosynthesize, these are called cyanobacteria. Then we see trilobites a layer higher. And then we see these weird plant-like animals called crinoids. And then we got a bunch of other marine animals. Nowhere worldwide do we see land animals at the bottom, in these bottom layers. Because land animals did not exist 520 million years ago. Above these first hard-bodied animals, we start to find a lot of fish fossils during a period known as the Devonian. 
Plants and insects had already made it to the land. Then in the late Devonian period, we start to see tetrapods, four-legged animal fossils appearing in the record. These evolved from fish that had evolved primitive lungs and legs in order to walk on the land. And I know that to some of you that sounds absolutely ridiculous. Take a look at this. This is the Apolette shark, an actual shark, which is a fish. It has the ability to shut off parts of its brain to reduce the need for oxygen. And it lives in very shallow water in the Great Barrier Reef. That's pretty clever, right? Wait, what's it doing now? Walking? Yes, it can walk on its fins. A walking shark. Good luck sleeping tonight. In Canada, some fossils of this creature called Tiktaalik were discovered. It's technically a fish, and it lived about 375 million years ago. And this is one of the most amazing transitional fossils ever found, having many characteristics of fish and tetrapods. Its fish characteristics include fish gills, fish scales, and fish fins. Fishapod characteristics include half fish, half tetrapod limb bones and joints, fish fins with bones and joints inside, including a functional wrist joint, and these radiating fish-like fins instead of toes, and a half fish, half tetrapod ear region. And then finally, the holy tetrapod characteristics include tetrapod rib bones, tetrapod mobile neck, with a separate pectoral girdle, and perhaps most importantly, tetrapod lungs. Gills and lungs. That seems pretty useful. Early tetrapods remained close to the land to lay their eggs, which, like fish eggs, were still soft. But these tetrapods had access to many more new food sources on the land, the plants and the insects that were already there. Amphibians soon arose from tetrapods, able to live equally at home in both land and water environments yet they still had to lay their eggs in the water. Amphibians are born as larvae with gills, and then later on they metamorphose into adults with lungs. Reptiles also arose from tetrapods around about 300 million years ago, and reptiles were the first vertebrates, animals with a backbone, that were able to live fully on the land. Remember, we're talking millions of years of very, very gradual evolution caused by small beneficial mutations, which allowed the most adapted animals to flourish in their environment. Dinosaurs then arose from reptiles around 240 million years ago, in a period called the Triassic. Mammals also evolved from a spin-off from the ancestor of reptiles called synapsids. That happened around 200 million years ago in the late Triassic to early Jurassic period. Unlike dinosaurs, reptiles and fish, mammals no longer laid eggs. They gave birth to live young and fed them milk through mammary glands. Early mammals were small because it made a lot of sense to avoid the dinosaurs as much as possible. As I already discussed, birds started to evolve from dinosaurs around 150 million years ago. Archaeopteryx is clearly a species in transition between both and many, many similar dino birds have been found since. The small size of mammals and the versatility of birds allowed both of them to survive the extinction of three quarters of species on Earth during the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event around 66 million years ago, when a massive asteroid hit the Earth just off South America. With no dinosaurs around, mammals got big. Some went back to the water and got really big, like the whale. The blue whale, which exists today, is the largest animal that has ever existed on Earth. Whales are mammals, not fish. They've got placentas, they feed milk to their young, and they are warm-blooded, just like other mammals, and completely unlike fish. They have bones in the front flippers, arm, wrist, hand, and finger bones, which are very similar to other mammals, like hippos and humans. Clearly though, whales do not have legs. However, all whale species today have the remains of a pelvis, and some species have been discovered with what looks like small vestigial hind legs. So if evolution is correct, then we should expect to find examples of whale-like creatures with hind legs. Anything else would be a disaster for the theory. In 1990 in Egypt, over 200 skeletons of Basilosaurus isis were discovered from a period of 37 million years ago. If you're wondering why it's a saurus, incomplete skeletons were first discovered in 1834, but they were thought to be from a giant reptile. Today, it's rather clear that we're looking at something very much more whale-like, and this is likely the second largest animal that ever lived. As for hind legs, 
it had these relatively tiny and absolutely useless limbs, for walking on at least, which it obviously never did. Basilosaurus was not the ancestor of modern whales, however. Just like Archaeopteryx, it was another evolutionary dead end. Today we believe that whales evolved from Dorudon, a smaller creature from around 40 million years ago. It too had vestigial hind legs. Going back to 46.5 million years ago, we find this sea-dwelling creature called Rhodhocetus. Its skeleton is very similar to Dorudon's, but it has clear hind legs, which probably meant it could walk on land. Just not for very long though, because the body would have been too heavy to support for very long, and fossils of this animal were almost always found alongside other marine animals. A million years previous to Rhodocetus was Ambulocetus, which was mostly aquatic, but could clearly walk on land when required. This is yet another true transitional fossil. And finally we get to Pachycetus, the mostly land-dwelling mammal which would have spent some time hunting in the water. And I realise many of you will find it difficult to believe that this is an ancestor of modern whales, but it was classified as an early cetacean due to features of the inner ear which are only found in whales, dolphins and porpoises. That is it in the entire animal kingdom. Whales, dolphins, porpoises and pachycetus have the same inner ear characteristic. And there is a kicker here, because genetically, the closest animal to today's whales is the hippopotamus. But whales didn't descend from the hippo, both descended from a common ancestor. And when you consider that hippos spend an awful lot of time in the water, 16 hours per day, and are able to hold their breath underwater for 5 minutes, and they give birth and feed their young underwater, and they've also got multi-chambered stomachs, just like the whale which incidentally is very, very rare for carnivores as whales are. Multi-chambered stomachs are for eating lots of grass. But we're done with the animals. Let's move on and talk a bit about genetics and finally, whether or not humans are special. Genetics is a field of biology that studies how traits are passed from parents to their offspring, which is a process we call heredity. Heredity is what makes children look like their parents. At the basic level, we have DNA, which is the underlying code that all life is based on. Every living thing requires DNA. Sequences of DNA, called genes, are contained inside chromosomes. Humans have around 20,000 genes in total, and, as I mentioned previously, 46 chromosomes, 23 of which are replicated from each parent during reproduction. Every single time reproduction occurs, mutations occur too. A mutation is simply a small difference in the DNA sequences, small changes in the genetic code. The vast majority of mutations are neutral, but some can create negative traits, and some can create positive traits. Over time, positive traits will be selected for, like the beaks on Darwin's finches, and negative traits will be filtered out. Positive really just means mutations or traits that make the organism more likely to pass on its genes. And this goes a long way to explaining why, when we look at the fossil record, life evolves to be more complex. If we look at part of the tree of life, where everything that evolved from tetrapods we can see that amphibians, reptiles, and birds are separate from the mammals. And within mammals, marsupials are further separated from humans than monkeys, cats, and rabbits are. If this is indeed how life evolved, species which are similar to other must surely have lots of similar genes, and species which are further removed from each other must have less. There are multiple ways to test this today. One method is by looking at the genes of a protein called cytochrome C, which is found in every living organism. Everyone. Proteins are made up of amino acids, and the cytochrome C protein has around 100 of these amino acids in a chain. Humans and chimpanzees have the exact same cytochrome C protein. Exactly the same. Compare it to monkeys, the difference is one amino acid. That's one difference out of 100. Compare it to rabbits, and it's 9. Compared to pigeons, and it's 12. Compared to the bullfrog, it's 20. Compared to the fruit fly, it's 24. Then we've got wheat germ and yeast, which are even further removed. This is exactly what evolution predicted. The further removed from a species we are, the more changes we see in the cytochrome C protein. But it's exactly the same with chimpanzees. 
This is the gene which, when it mutates, can cause cystic fibrosis. The more green the bars are, the more similar the genetic code is to humans. The gene in chimpanzees is at least 99% identical. Orangutans, which are the fourth closest animal to humans after chimps, bonobos and gorillas, have slightly more differences, including a completely different section here. Baboons, which are monkeys, have slightly more differences again, including a larger missing part. And this goes all the way down the primates till we get to mice. Still mammals, of course, but with quite a lot of differences. Then chickens, which are birds are even further removed, very, very little shared genetic code there. And then we get to the puffer fish at the bottom. This is exactly what evolution predicted. It is exactly what we see with cytochrome C. And it's exactly what we see in the fossil record. So if proteins are similar between closely related species, and genes are too, what else must be similar? How about chromosomes? Marsupials, while they are still mammals, are a subgroup including animals living in South America and Australia. The vast majority of South American marsupials have 14 chromosomes, and some species have 18 or 22. Even though they now exist far apart, we would still expect the Australian marsupials to have similar numbers of chromosomes. The Tasmanian devil has 14, koalas and kangaroos have 16, all in the same ballpark as we'd expect from species which have evolved from common ancestors. Now, it's important to note that chromosome count alone cannot tell you what kind of species it is. For example, here we can see garlic also has 16 chromosomes. And there's clearly quite a lot of difference between garlic and a kangaroo and a koala. What's important here is that species which we believe evolved most recently from a common ancestor have similar counts. Cats have 38 chromosomes. Mice have got 40. Rabbits have got 44. And around about this point in the tree, we can be fairly confident that the ancestor of mice, rabbits and cats probably had between 38 and 44 chromosomes, and that would likely have been 40 or 42. Sperm whales have 42, right smack in mammal territory where you'd expect to see them. Now, the great white shark could well have around 42 as well, as I just discussed. However, that would have been mere coincidence. In fact, the great white shark has 82. And you remember that whale hippo thing that I talked about earlier? Hippos have 36. So is this perfect evidence of evolution? Well, not quite. Because dogs have 78. How can that be possible? Does that mean that dogs are more like sharks? The answer to that is of course no. To be frank, counting chromosomes in this way is pretty far from being an exact science. When new species evolve, they can create new chromosomes by splitting current ones or they can combine chromosomes their ancestors had, reducing the overall number. The last common ancestor between dogs and cats lived 40 million years ago. We can't know for sure, but it likely had somewhere around 50 chromosomes. Cats have combined a bunch of them, and dogs have split a bunch since that point 40 million years ago. What would be a real problem for evolution would be if wolves and jackals, dingoes, dogs and coyotes had wildly different chromosome counts, as they have clearly all descended from a common ancestor much earlier than 40 million years ago. But they don't. In fact, they've all got 78, with the two exceptions of the bush dog and maned wolves on 74 and 76 respectively. Tigers and lions, 38, the same as a domestic cat and every other cat as expected. What is actually important about this though is the genes. It's the DNA and that's where we see the most similarities between similar species. The real reason I started talking about chromosomes here was to show you what happened with primates. The group of animals of which we humans are part of. Monkeys are a large group and generally have between 42 and 48 chromosomes, with some outliers. Baboons are an old world monkey and they have 42. When we get to the great apes, orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos and humans, if evolution is true, then the last common ancestor of all must have lived around about 20 million years ago. We keep finding different skulls, going back a few tens of millions of years, then a few million years, a few hundred thousand years and then a few tens of thousands of years until we get to the human skull. We never ever find any of these skulls or any part of primate fossils next to Archaeopteryx or the dinosaurs or trilobites. 
because they were all extinct before primates existed. And what's more, the further back the fossils go, the more we see evidence of walking on all four limbs instead of the bipedal motion of humans today. The first fossils we found of a species which walked upright, Homo erectus, is dated at 2 million years. Since then we've discovered more and more and we now believe bipedal motion evolved around about 4.4 million years ago in a species called Ardipithecus ramidus. Although it very lightly walked upright, judging by its skull, it would have looked much more like an ape than a human. All other fossils found before this period indicate that primates were small animals walking on all fours. But with monkeys having 42 to 48 chromosomes, and humans having 46 chromosomes, you might think that the other great apes, the chimps, bonobos, gorillas and orangutans, would be very likely to have 46 too. But they don't. They all have 48. There are two options for why that is, and one of them is much more likely than the other. Orangutans aren't shown on this, but they also have 48 chromosomes, remember. So that means that either all of our common ancestors had 48 chromosomes, and humans combined two of them, or our common ancestor had 46, and all the other great apes gained two. Clearly, the vastly more likely explanation is the first. Our ancestor had 48, and humans combined two of them. In which case, evolutionary biology says that we will surely find evidence of that in our genes. Here is a comparison of human, chimp, gorilla, and orangutan chromosomes, from left to right. And you've probably noticed I've blanked out number two for now. As you can see, they're all fairly similar lengths and shapes, which is what evolution would suggest. Mutations are happening every generation, but it's generally not so fast that we normally see huge changes between similar species. And then you get to chromosome two, or I should say chromosome two in humans, chromosome 2a and 2b in the other great apes. These are actual chromosomes that you will find in any member of each species if you look at their cells under a microscope. So what has happened here with chromosome 2? Zooming in a bit and it looks like a little join there, where the others are clearly separate chromosomes. Chromosomes contain various different parts and almost all of them have a single centromere, which is normally but not always near the centre of the chromosome, hence the name, and also two telomeres one at each end. Telomeres kind of stop the DNA from unravelling, a bit like the little thing at the end of shoelaces. And when we look at human chromosome 2, we find that there are two telomeres in the middle and at the ends, and we also have two centromeres. However, one of them has been switched off, leaving a single working centromere a bit further down than the usual. Zooming in even further to the actual DNA code, we can see the fusion point. If human chromosome 2 isn't a combination of these two genes, which came from a common ancestor we shared with the other great apes, then please tell me what in the name of creation it is. And the kicker, both Homo neanderthalensis, Neanderthals, and Denisovans, the two closest species to humans, but both now sadly extinct, they have the same fusion point in their second chromosome. It's very difficult to get a complete picture of their DNA as DNA breaks down and it gets very messy over time. However, this fusion point having been found means that both of those species almost certainly had 46 chromosomes too. And genetics is extremely cool stuff. Each of these letters is called a nucleotide and there are four in DNA called thymine, the T, cytosine, the C, adenine, the A, and guanine, the G. And if we compare human and chimp DNA sequences, this is for the gene that encodes the hormone leptin. We only see five nucleotide differences out of 250. So this does the exact same thing in humans and chimps, and there are only five differences in the gene. And where the human and chimpanzees differ, the corresponding nucleotide in the gorilla, which is the green shaded bar, that can be used to show us what the most likely setup was in the common ancestor of all three species. So in this first case, both the human and the gorilla have A, the chimp has G. It's much more likely that the common ancestor had A and the chimps mutated to G. And it's the opposite story for the next one. And we can see this looking at the other remaining nucleotides. Science is just the most incredible thing humans have. And if this has been God-given, 
it was given so that we could figure this stuff out. And with that, let's go on to the summary. Most of you know me as something of a researcher and big picture guy. And that's what I've tried to do here. And if I look through my list of stuff that I had researched but didn't include, there's far more of that than what made the video. The evidence for evolution that I have presented here is a tiny, tiny fraction of the available evidence. So let's get to that elephant in the room. Going back to the chart and the comments that made me do this video, clearly the major reason for this lack of belief in evolution comes down to religion. But it's not just any religion because, in fact, both the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church and the Catholic Church both state clearly that there is no contradiction between evolution and the theory of creation. The Central Conference of American Rabbis was quite scathing in its attack against anti-science. And the Clergy Letter Project, signed by more than 10,000 Christian clergy members, stated, To reject the truth of evolution is to deliberately embrace scientific ignorance and transmit such ignorance to our children. But how can so many high-profile believers in God be willing to accept evolution as fact? Well, for a start, there is absolutely nothing in the entire theory of evolution that says God did not create life. In fact, science cannot explain how life began. We have ideas about how it started, and my personal belief is that we'll be able to create very basic single-celled life from scratch in under 10 years' time. I personally do not believe in any creator. However, I am still willing to at least entertain the possibility. Until science shows us that life can arise naturally without any requirement at all for the supernatural. And for that life to be real, it would also have to evolve. Getting back to this 4 in 10 Americans who believe that humans did not evolve from earlier species. Why is this happening when the evidence for evolution is so absolutely overwhelming? Well, while researching this topic, I became aware of certain creationist groups and websites that rather than promoting creation, spend an inordinate amount of time dismissing evolution instead. And nearly every single time, it is done in the same way. They laser focus on one tiny example and make their case based on either a current lack of scientific knowledge about some part of it, or they take comments by scientists out of context. One example of what I mean would be this 1999 article over at Answers in Genesis, which claims that turtles are uniquely designed creatures continuing to defy evolutionary explanation. And the guts of their claim was due to the New Encyclopedia Britannica claiming that the evolution of the turtle is one of the most remarkable in the history of the vertebrates. However, in the very next sentence it states, Unfortunately, the origin of this highly successful order is obscured by the lack of early fossils, although turtles leave more and better fossil remains than do other vertebrates. The article continues, Dr. Dwayne Gish, in his book Evolution, the fossils still say no, says that given the amazingly unique structure of turtles, it should be a rather easy task to find the transitional forms to trace the evolutionary path from ancestral reptile to turtle, if that is in fact what happened. And he explains that the changes would not be subtle, but obvious, even to someone with no training in anatomy or paleontology. Randall Martin proclaimed, Surely an incomplete shell would give little protection. Any tiny advantage would be far outweighed by the serious disadvantages of a cumbersome hindrance in getting away from the predators. With the article ending, the biblical account of creation in Genesis, animals created to reproduce after their kinds, would mean that turtles should be instantly recognisable as turtles, with the shell and other unique features fully formed from the start and no series of pre-turtle ancestors should be found. It is obvious that the fossil record of turtles gives powerful support to biblical creation and stands opposed to the idea of evolution. So basically, one example, no turtles found with half a shell because it wouldn't give any protection. And if Genesis is correct, no pre-turtle ancestors should ever be found. Ladies and gentlemen, let me present to you Odontochelis, discovered in China in 2008, with only one shell on its belly. It's got pretty broad back ribs, but it hasn't formed a solid shell on its back yet. And in spite of some primitive features, which you would expect from an early turtle, this is clearly a turtle. 
with half a shell covering its belly. Why would that be a selective advantage though? Well, when you're a turtle, there's usually an awful lot more water below you than above, and some protection is better than none. What we're seeing here and everywhere on these sites is this God of the gaps fallacy in which they take current gaps in scientific knowledge. It's true, 1999, we had no half-shell turtle fossils, but that was used as evidence that evolution must be false, when the truth is, we were simply just waiting to find it. And the truth is, almost all of these gaps in the transitional species have been closed a long, long time ago. This article should be pulled from this website, instead of still being here misleading readers. And to be frank, there's a lot of clear intended misinformation too. Some creationists will use Darwin's own comments about the lack of transitional fossils from the origin of species, the ones that I talked about earlier, as some kind of proof, and they will just completely ignore the fact that Archaeopteryx was discovered only two years later. And today we have, you know, look at this list of transitional fossils. This is actual transitional species, not single fossils and there are over 200 of them. 200 species of transitional fossils found, and thousands upon thousands of actual fossils. The eye is far too complex to have evolved is one that is often heard. And over at Rational Faith, the author states that the eye is such a marvel of intricate design, it deals a devastating blow to evolution. In response, evolutionists cannot turn to logic or science to refute the testimony the eye provides that it was clearly designed. So instead, they do what they do best, tell stories. He then goes on to tell his own story about the evolution of planes, which we know were made by design. And he makes no attempt whatsoever to address the question, the actual point that was brought up by evolutionists. That being that multiple different stages of eye evolution are seen today in species. Species like the planarian here, which has these little eye spots. All these are capable of distinguishing is light direction, but no more. It can tell which way the light's coming from. Here is how eyes started out. Species like the nautilus, which has a primitive pinhole camera type of eye, which is nowhere near as good as a human eye. Species like these 10 animals that don't actually have eyes at all. Why would you have no eyes? What possible evolutionary advantage could that confer? Well, when you live in utter darkness like these species do, eyes confer zero advantage anyway. In fact, they are more likely to be selected out of a population due to the risk of infections causing death or disease which is very likely why these animals are selected not to have any eyes. What seems paradoxical is actually evolution at its finest. Anything you don't need is likely to become a drawback. And here's a bunch of mollusks with different eyes at different stages of evolution, right down to the complex eye of the octopus, which incidentally is a better eye than the human eye because the octopus eye doesn't have any blind spots, unlike humans. And here we can see the nautilus someplace in the middle and the very basic photoreceptor eyes that we saw in the planarian. Anyone who says that the eye can't have evolved is lying to you, or they did not do the most rudimentary research into the topic. And sadly, it has become all too clear to me that in almost every case, some of these creationists are lying to you, which is not a trait that I recognise in most religious people that I know. I could go on and on and on, some of you probably thought I've gone on far too long already, so I'm going to end this now. Perhaps God does exist, and perhaps God created life. But if that is true, then it is an absolute fact that God created life with the explicit purpose of evolving to more complex forms. Life is evolution, and we can see it everywhere we look. Some of you who are unsure will hopefully now be sure. Some of you who are sure evolution is false will hopefully have changed your minds or at least be more open to the idea, and do your own research. And I know for a fact that some of you will never change your minds. I was well aware of that before I embarked on this absolutely massive video. And if you are in that camp, then you're free to believe in whatever you want to. As for me, I will continue to put my faith in science. I'll be back with a real tech video soon enough. And I'll catch you later, guys.